Um, every time I go on the internet and I ever hear about your name, it's always like David Abrazee should be back in Pearl Jam. Is that something that would ever fucking happen for a nerd like me? I can't imagine it. It wouldn't be up to me, but I, at this point, I can't imagine it ever. The conversation, the first 15 minutes of me walking into a room with those guys, um, I could, I could picture a couple of hugs, but then inevitably there'd be some questions about royalty rates and, uh, you know, all these other, it, it would just get ugly quick. So. So I'm, I'm, I, I couldn't be more excited, ladies and gentlemen. I know I normally have a lot more energy, but I, I want to maintain it because the last time I had this legend, this absolute juggernaut of a human being on this show, all I did was speak over him because I was so excited, like a little puppy dog that just wants to lick a face of this hero that I didn't allow. Like I had probably 7,000 comments saying, shut the fuck up. So this time when I interview the amazing the illustrious, the incredibly beat, fantastic, funkalicious motherfucker that is David Abruzzese of the international motherfuckers of David Abruzzese of Pearl Jam during the very, 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 very best time. Little time in Guns N' Roses, maybe? And a philosopher, a drummer, and just a great human being. How are you, David? I'm good. I wish I wasn't wearing headphones. But I think my neighbors ought to hear all that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you get to come back and see us now that we've learned a thing or two about talking to people. <laughs> but better equipment, better interview skills, let's hope. <laughs> Man, you guys are a treat all the time. <laughs> well, you're a treat all the time. I mean, it's been great to like become your friend and follow what you're doing. And yeah, I mean, it's it's been such a long time. So we're gr- we're grateful to have you back on. It has been a long time. Last time we talked, wasn't there like a pandemic and all this stuff going on? I believe there was, yeah. <laughs> it's been a minute. So how how have you been? Have you have you been busy, David? <laughs> you know, I have. I have <laughs> been busy actually. Um Yeah. Yeah, I've been busy. <laughs> you want me to expand on that? Of course. Tell us what you've been working on. <laughs> Can't leave it a mystery. <laughs> that I would normally talk over you for ten minutes, but now I'm trying to wait by l- Continue. <laughs> now you're going to find out I'm a really shitty interview. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I see you posting new music all the time, man. Yeah, there, and there's so much to come. Um, you know, that between that and all our heroes dying all of a sudden, what's going on with this? Are you talking about Lisa Marie or Jeff Beck? Or or, or the Everson Lake and Palmer guy? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> since yeah, we I'll saw you, did, what, didn't Neil Pert die since I saw you last? I mean, for fuck's sake, it's been that long. Like, I mean, oh my God. It, John Powell was alive last time you were on the show. <laughs> Actually, I had a full mouth of teeth. I had a, I'll just put it out there now. I got, I was riding on the two, the two wheeler, right? And I hit a big hole and my teeth clicked and two teeth went crap ow. So now I can, now I can say that. So, I can smile and I look a little bit like redneck it's because I kind of am <laughs> see the thing is I love about working with you David is that like when we were doing Lost Symphony you would say hey because if, if anyone hasn't heard it the Garden of Earthly Delights with David he's it's the greatest like in the pocket song the sound he got in the drums and that song is incredible but he, he would disappear for a month and be like hey I'm sorry I broke my arm I was going around a volcano and uh, I, you know, I hit a duck going off the, going into a moat and you're like, what? And then he really does these things. And then this time he said he couldn't come on the show because he knocked out his teeth. And I'm like, come on, man. And here we are. You knocked out. How did you knock out your, you, you hit your teeth off the, the cement, like American history X style. No, that was the first time. These, this is a whole new set of teeth. <laughs> this is a new oh teeth thing, God. but uh, whatever. But yeah, I've been working on a lot of music. <laughs> you got so much, Benny. We have a song coming out soon, and just which in time, one? And now it's got, instead of being just a, a tip of the head uh, hat to Jeff Beck, it's going to be a tribute to Jeff Beck. That's crazy. Yeah, that's right. We did we did Stevie Wonder, but we did a Jeff Beck version of it. Am I allowed to say what it is? Yeah. Yeah. 
we, we, we're doing super. So I've done a bunch of songs with David, so I don't even know what he's going to release yet and what I'm allowed to talk about. But a while ago, maybe about a half a decade ago, we did a song called Superstition by a, a guy named Stevie Wonder. But it's the Jeff Beck version. Very specific because we have Joanna Connor who's one of the greatest slide players in history. If you haven't seen this, this wonderful lady of a player, she's, if you've seen like those little shorts of this crazy chick, just Eddie Van Halen, this, uh, the slide guitar, that's Joanna Connor. She's from Worcester, Massachusetts, where I was born. And we're now on a tribute to Jeff Beck called Superstition with David. Yeah, and Jeff Fielder is on that thing, and Jeff Nolan's on that thing, and James Mowry's on that thing. There's so many. It's great. Great. It really sounds good, too. But it's, yeah, it's the, it's the Beck, Bogart, and a piece kind of version of the song. So you don't call them Apice? It's not, it's not Apice, it's a piece. I get confused. I know one brother's a piece, one brother's Apice. I don't know. One of them's fudgy and one of them plays extra slow behind yeah. Dio. Yeah. <laughs> I was a big fan of, of the, 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 the a piece, Apathy brother behind Dio. Man, he was great. And then I met him and he was a, just not very friendly, but like the well, wait, so tell us that story. So for those that don't know, there's a guy named Vinny Apisay. He played in Heaven and Hell, which is uh, the Black Sabbath version that had um, Ryan James Dio. And then he also played um, on Dio's pivotal albums. And he's a great drummer. But I al- he always kind of seems like he's behind, like so behind the beat that it's almost uncomfortable. Uh, well, it was kind of a turning point for my rock and roll me. I was at the NAMM show with Roger Hudson from Supertramp. You know, we were working together, and we went to the NAMM show. I, I saw uh, it was Vinny and, you know, uh, I think Bill Ward from Sabbath and a couple other, and I approached him thinking that, you know, you know, I'm still in Pearl Jam. You know, maybe they'll give me the time of day. And, no, they all they stopped talking and looked at me like, why are you interrupting us talking with a hello? And I just kind of uncomfortably backed out. But then I ran around the corner to catch up to Roger and I ran smack into Stevie Wonder. Boom! (laughs) And and laid him out. He was like on his back. And I was standing over him with my hand down, like waiting for him to grab my hand so I could (laughs) lift him up. (laughs) One of the funniest moments ever. Because he's laying there and he's laughing and his big, huge... uh, security guys are all standing around and I'm like literally straddling his stomach, holding my arm out like, hello. <laughs> he didn't lift up. He didn't reach up and grab my arm and a couple of the security guards. <laughs> they were laughing when they picked so him wait, up. So wait, you knocked over Stevie wonder. He's fucking blind, bro. Yeah. <laughs> What's your excuse? I was dumb <laughs> and fast. <laughs> I just saw a crowd and went to dodge in between them and didn't realize they were huge black dudes and, and there was one with a bunch of braids and beads in his hair and that's clamo <sighs> yeah <laughs> and then Gene Simmons came up and I it, it, just after that I was still giggling and I ran into my buddy Robert Cooper this bass player who was playing with Pete Bros at the time and Robert was wearing a black shirt with the classic Gene Simmons face makeup in white. Great shirt. And all of a sudden, Gene Simmons walks up and says, suppose you want me to sign that. And just grabbed his shirt and went, scribble, scribble, scribble. And my friend's standing there going, oh. and Gene Simmons is walking off. And he's, hey, that guy fucked up my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> look on Gene's face when he looked over his shoulder. So it was like within five minutes, snubbed by Vinny, knocked Stevie Wonder to the ground, and then (laughs) forgot he was blind, and Gene Simmons ruined my buddy's shirt. The NAMM show. (laughs) It's an eventful day. (laughs) Uh, Oh, oh, even better. Right after that, to top it all off, uh, I, I catch up with Roger at the Pro Tools booth. And it was one of the Pro Tools that just, like, was just flipping, you know, just coming out. Uh, like, you know, the, the following year, I, I paid $65,000 for my 
you know, uh, size of a refrigerator digital contraption that, you know, was, uh, it was a uh, hundred megahertz Pentium. And that was like, Oh, so I'm talking to this guy. Roger's talking to these people at the pro tools thing. I'm talking to this guy about how I think pro tools is going to ruin music. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me a card and I went home and at some point was taking all these cards out of my bag. And I looked at it, and it was the president of Pro Tools. <laughs> what a day! <laughs> Tell us about that, though. Why, what was why, why did why was your opinion that Pro Tools would ruin music? I want to hear your perspective. Well, I told him. I said it's all about the fucking. The, it's all about the the third verse and the third chorus. It's all about that. Where to me, as a drummer, that's about all the emotion, all the power of the lyric and the melody and everything. And after that hook and all that stuff, it comes into that, you know, it, you might be playing the same part, but there's a nuance and a power and a cohesion that's different. And at the time, everybody was all about, you know, okay, we got the verse, chop, chop, chop. There's right, three verses. the copy-paste mentality. Uh, yeah, and it was, it was like, that's what everyone was like, yay, Pro Tools, we don't, you know, we can fix it and we can copy and paste it. And that's how it was being used at the time. And I just explained that that's, that it was going to ruin rock and roll because it's going to take away that that third verse or that third chorus cohesion and energy. And the guy was going, "Huh, that's very interesting." And, I, and I'm, I mean, <laughs> when I realized that it was the president of Pro Tools, but yeah, but he stayed tuned in. You know, he enjoyed the conversation. But David, do you know whose fault it? It's it's John Lennon because when he was sitting in the studio. He said, I don't, want, I don't want to do doubles anymore. So what they did is they just copied his exact vocal and then someone just sat there slowly turning the, the speed up and down so it's just enough different that it can give you that doubly sound. So really, what John Lennon was, was he was a pioneer in bullshit Pro Toolsing. And I thought you were going to say the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of looked Japanese, didn't he? Like, what was Yoko? Was she Japanese? Yeah, Yoko is Japanese. Yeah. Oh, she's still alive. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. Don't, don't be. <laughs> oh, that's like, so what? Like, like, so Jeff Beck, <laughs> but not Yoko. I get it. Fucking world. Uh, Yoko, come on, man. Yoko, Yoko is one of the sweetest, most incredible people that I would ever had the chance to meet. Okay, so take uh, so let me take that back. So Yoko has a really bad stigma, but then you go and watch all these things, and you're like, she was totally Paul's an asshole, and George Harrison was out of his fucking mind. Yoko seems almost temperate. <laughs> so do you think that she got a bad like when someone says, "Hey, you're being a Yoko," I know what that means, but maybe that wasn't fair. What do you think, David, having met the sweet Yoko Ono? If you're being a Yoko, that means you're being supportive to your exceptionally talented husband in the best way that you can that's not really a bad thing is wow no mm. it's a good perspective yeah. especially over you know i mean the, the choice was we got you know we got two beatles albums that we wouldn't have got if she weren't there to support john that's for sure so so what's she like in person man cute as a button and awesome and smart and funny and um yeah, exceptional, exceptional. She, uh, there was a, a moment in time where my lady at the time, Sherry and I were, um, you know, at, at we were with Sean at, at his place in the Dakota, and um, we, you know, at this point, had been spending a lot of time together, Sean and I, and um, so I think she wanted to come down and see, you know, who is this older person who who has influence over my son. So I want to meet him. So she came in and she rolled one up and um, and we partook of it. And then uh, we were all just sitting there having a chit chat. And out of the blue, about 10 minutes in, she, she belly laughed and said, <laughs> you're hippies. And everything was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Does the fact that she got us two extra Beatles albums negate, like, you know, like reverse 
you know, like these wa- these noiseless headphones? Does it negate the fact that she's literally the most terrifying sounding singer ever? That sounds like if a theremin was going through a, an MT2 distortion box. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not a sound for everyone, is it? <laughs> <laughs> you nice probably like it. that, don't you? You probably <laughs> love the fact that she's like. No, I. You know, I. I had. I gave it many, many chances. Uh, but no, that. <laughs> That look that she that uh, John Lennon and uh, who was it was it Chuck Berry I think shot her when she decided to join in on their jam with vocals. Oh, oh yeah, 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 dude, yeah, yeah. the yeah. Rolling Stone Circus. Yeah. It's it's the greatest. I'm gonna get that look on my face too. It's hard, but the, as far as a cultural, uh, because that type of singing that she does is actually a, a very famous, very you know well respected style of Japanese vocalizing. And she's one of the best at it. Ah, didn't know that. Did, did not you? know that. No. I feel like I need to ask Marty Friedman, who's Mr. Guitar in Japan, if that's actually <laughs> true. I feel like if you Snopes it, it's like, no, people in Japan don't want Yoko Ono representing their nation. Uh, uh, no, they they love Yoko. <laughs> I think you can Google it, <laughs> oh, but Marty would probably know. Well, you mentioned being involved with with Sean. That that was sort of your entry to meeting her. So, what c- can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, we were playing in New York City Pearl Jam back in the day, day, and um, after the show, <laughs> there was this this kid who's hanging out with this older dude, and. Um, and we just started talking and, and halfway through the conversation, I was really blown away. We were having, you know, it was like really hit it off. And, um, you know, he, he had said his name was Sean, but you know, my, I, I was just paying attention to our conversation, not really about, uh, who he might be or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's New York city. So the union guys come in, okay, you fucking guys got to bust it up. Time to go home. You know, there's you know, <laughs> a certain amount of time to hang out. So uh, he says, you want to come back? You want to come back to my place and play some guitar? Sure. And I looked at the old guy that was standing next to him. And I was like, is that all right? And the guy looked at me like I had a hole in my head. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. The guy that I, you know, so we get a cab. And Eric Johnson, the floor manager of Pearl Jam, came with me. And next thing you know, we pull up in front of the Dakota. And it's like, oh, okay, Sean. Now I get it. He lived in the Dakota. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, so it's really funny because the guy that I had asked if it was okay was uh, you remember the, sh- the photo of John Lennon with the New York City T-shirt on and the glass that really mm-hmm. iconic. Photo? Yeah, taken by, taken by Bob Gruen. It was Bob Gruen that I thought was this kid Sean's dad. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know who Bob Gruen is. I, I, if you had to notice from around the studio, I, I, I collect, I dabble in nerdy paraphernalia. So I, asked, I asked Bob if it was okay if I come over to Sean's place. Yeah. I, thought, I thought he was Sean's dad. So anyway, we pull up at the Dakota and we go up and, you know, I'm instantly struck. There's so many layers of this story. I'm instantly blown away by the doorman because when I was 17 in my first solo trip, as a young adult to New York City, uh, it was really important to, to me to go to the Dakota um, and pay homage to to Lennon. And when I got there, I was taking a picture and this doorman came out and was like, hey, get the fuck out of here, blah, blah, blah. And being a 17-year-old idiot, I, you know, we exchanged words. I told him, flat fuck off, and blah, 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 back and forth. And this was the same guy that opened the door for me. Uh, that night with Sean and I was like wow and to close that part off I did get a chance uh, a few months later to go down in the middle of the night and and sit down and apologize to that guy which was a huge thing for me and and it was it was really yeah something special Um, come to find out you know he was the the guy you know who was applying direct pressure you know and here I was some disrespectful asshole who had no clue about anything you know giving the guy grief so it was nice to be able to go back and do that. But anyway, this first time, <laughs> so we go up and we're sitting there and um, Sean comes out of the back room and, and he's got a couple guitars and he hands me one and and uh, 
we smoked a little and we talked a bunch and he was getting up to go help um his girlfriend at the time eva she was making some tea and i it, while he was getting up i was like looking at this incredible guitar and i was like man you really, really ought to take better care of this guitar i mean these things are rusty the pots are noisy and there's you know it's just needs to be fixed up a little bit and he just you know casually says oh yeah that's one my dad played on the rooftop and walked up <laughs> yeah you're playing his exact strings dude that was john lennon oxidiz- uh, oxidation on those strings yeah. asshole mm-hmm. yeah and, I just, and the way he said it was just like eh, eh. <laughs> and it was like you know pearl jam at the time we had worked so hard that we hadn't really splintered off into any of the trappings of or the world that we were now a part of and this was really the first time that you know i'd, I'd had that experience of, and I, I looked over at eric her manager and he looked at me and we both just went <laughs> like <laughs> i mean it, you know it seemed like it was just yesterday we were climbing in that 14 passenger van and 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 now I'm, it's like that that moment hit me like a ton of bricks that it was like wow i'm actually playing john guitar and this you know one of my heroes and it's like this weird little cycle had started but um yeah we became really good friends after that and you know uh, um spent a lot of time hanging out and yeah it's good good time but (laughs) but that was the most shocking moment (laughs) that one and it's funny out of all the time that we spent together hanging out there's there's i think there's only one photo of us together but i really like that photo just casually hanging out for the limelight gig looking down at all the Saturday Night Live cast that had, <laughs> they assembled behind the stage on the, like, the, the the limelight was an old church, and behind it, it had all these stairs that went up behind the band, and it was just, like, all these famous New York people lining the stairs, and we were looking down on it, kind of making fun of <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Amazing. I mean, Amazing I think, time. first off, I, I want to say, just to, to tie it back in, I've always been told it's the same people on the way up as it is on the way down. And I think that that, that, that doorman is, is an example mm-hmm. of like one of those universal, not coincidences, but just like one of those moments where like your whole life, you, you relive that moment. You're in front of the Dakota. You're in front of where John Lennon got shot. You're in front of where all of these things happened. And you, you feel that. So you want to go take those pictures as a punk ass 17 year old. And you think that that dude is them and the us and them. And then the rest of your life, you realize that you're, he's protecting all that you all thought was holy and that you were actually the them. And that, that whole life, yep. you, you have that uh, option to think about like, what would I have done differently? I wish I could go say, I'm sorry. And then the universe mm-hmm. happens upon Sean Lennon. Send Sean your way. He, your friend's like, cool, I'm good. I got, I don't got nowhere to be. And then you end up back playing John Lennon's guitar in the goddamn Dakota. And the same guy opens the door and you have the opportunity after playing these oxidized strings to walk back downstairs and say, hey, I was that 17-year-old asshole, but I am no longer that same asshole. I have changed. And part of the reason I've changed is because of you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was an amazing thing. And it, it's something I, I, I cherish. Uh, even more than playing the guitar was the opportunity to get to know that guy and, um, and you know, to have the opportunity to, to I, I guess, uh, experience gr- having grown up a little bit, you know? It's nice. Given the opportunity to, to, to um, yeah, mature. Such a, such a profoundly deep way you know it's like I, I had those pictures and those those pictures of me in my charvel t-shirt standing where the x's were on the sidewalk um you know uh it's like they they were always there was always something really uncomfortable about that picture you know it was such a meaningful moment but it was such an uncomfortable like that that the moment uh, you know became such a kind of a stigma of, of what, and then having the opportunity and now that picture means something, you know, cool. means something better. Yeah. How old were you at that point? 
Uh, I was 17 when I took that picture, but I was 23, 24. Yeah. Which is amazing to think about uh, that it was just, you know, isn't it a trip how 17 to 23 is just a little blip in time, but it, at the time it seemed like a long time, you know? Well, I mean, listen, man, I, I just did a, a, a video on the neurotic guitars about Randy Rhodes. And you go back and you realize that Randy Rhodes was 25 fucking years old. I'm 40 now, dude. I'm 40 goddamn years old. <laughs> I could technically be his dad. I mean, not, I mean, a weird situation, but it's like crazier has happened than that. I could be his dad and I don't play like Randy Rose. And I remember like I, and I couldn't believe with how many hits I was getting, how many people were just like, he changed my life. I remember pulling over to the side of the road. I remember literally hearing who is that guy who could be better than Tony Iommi. And then they go and see Randy Rhodes. And it's one of those things like yeah. he was alive till 25 Morrison uh, J and Jimi Hendrix, 27. Like, yeah, it's unbelievable. So, it's like, dude, I have shits that have been sitting in my goddamn intestine for longer than that. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to seek some help, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you know, I've been watching you guys, and all of you have been doing such great things. And, and I've really gotten into your neurotic guitar thing benny it's amazing how much i've learned about the instruments and and yeah and, and you possess all these instruments that you talk about for the most part they're, they're there yours, are some yeah? there's yeah 90% uh, yeah. of my videos are me. I, 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 when I'm holding Eddie Van Halen's guitar, it's my buddy who's behind the show. So when I, he lets me flex and pretend like it's mine and I can go borrow it, he'll probably <laughs> send it to me in the mail if I ask him to. But like, it's not mine. I mean, I'm not a gajillionaire living in a giant ivory, you know, tower in San Diego in the gaslight district, but a gas lamp, gas, I'm gaslighting him right now. I love this guy, by the way, but he's got an Eddie Van Halen guitar and I get to play it on my show and people are like, what the fuck, asshole? I'm like, I know. I know. I don't deserve this either. Just like David with John Lennon's guitar. What an asshole. Fix it up. Change the strings. Let me set it up for you. Oh my God, Sean! I'll fix it up for you. I got some elixirs in my car. <laughs> yeah, that's just uh, yeah. I never really thought about that, but yeah, I, I, you gave me a perspective there. <laughs> yeah, you really ought to fix this guitar up. I never connected the dot that he might have been offended by that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, but that's Benny. why you're endearing. That's why you're endearing. That's why Sean loves you. He's like that guy's great. <laughs> Who couldn't love you, David Abraziz? You're the most lovable drummer that's ever been in Pearl Jam. <laughs> uh, what was it, my friend? Uh, the nicest guy in rock. <laughs> <laughs> you really are, though. I mean, speaking of following what people are doing, I mean, I'm following you on Facebook and all this, and you are you have such a positive spirit. You know, you're always like so. You've got a, such a great outlook on everything, and you're always wanting to make music and spread the love and. You know, there's so much negativity. It's such a, it's just refreshing to see that, that you're just like, your love for what you do and for people and for just music is so infectious that you just, you got to share it. Well, I'm glad that comes across. I've thought about opening a, um, another Facebook page for all the posts that I, uh, no, delete. <laughs> <laughs> Going to have an alter ego. The rants. <laughs> Yeah, my alter ego, the, you know, Grumpy Dave posts. Because, <laughs> oh, man, this the, over this political world, wow, I have to bleach myself so hard. I uh, Sometimes I just, I just go to Notepad and I just go, like, as if it were going to be a post, just so mm -hmm. I can delete it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen the people blow up on your feed. Oh, yeah. That's always fascinating, isn't it? They show up from nowhere and they have yeah. no friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's a common thread among the haters. Well, you know what I love though, David, is like when people come onto your page, and I mean, I love this too because I, I, because you'll sometimes help me troll, and I'll go and troll you be because they're like there are legit assholes. I'm like, dude, you're on his actual page. He's the actual guy that you grew up listening to. It's like, and you are, and it's like these people have these uh, so many opinions. And listen, I understand if you've sold tens of millions of records or if you play drums unbelievably or whatever but the fact that you possess a keyboard 
does not make you a warrior, my friend. It just makes you a dumb dumb. <laughs> yeah, an asshole sometimes. It's kind of fun of though. I mean, I, I have, there have been a few guys that um, actually no, I take that back. There has been one lady. <laughs> that actually you know she chimed in and i was i said you know like my standard go-to is you know feel free to teach me something don't just go off you know um you know and this one lady actually engaged me in in conversation and and um like maybe once a week we'd go back and forth about things and 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 it was interesting because she realized that she couldn't teach me shit and so she ended up learning some stuff, and that was kind of cool. That was fun. But that's pr- pretty rare that that I think people engage long enough to allow their perspective to be changed. A lot of times, it's like they come with their opinion and they leave as soon as there's, you know, some disagreement. Yeah, especially with politics, or they come with their agreement and then it's just ah, oh, it, it trips me out how like I'll look. And it'll be someone chiming in, and then they it's like they just get attacked. You know, there'll be one post as a comment, and then the spread of just ah, 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 people just hen pecking them. It's, I usually go in and, and I'll, I'll, I'll send an apology to all the people that, you know, all my friends on Facebook that are in that little pecking thread. And let them know that I deleted it <laughs> because it's just, it's like they all look like assholes and it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> so speaking of assholes, um, every time I go on the internet and I ever hear about your name, it's always like David Abrazi should be back in Pearl Jam. Is that something that would ever fucking happen for a nerd like me? I can't imagine it. It wouldn't be up to me, but I at this point, I can't imagine it ever. It seems like they're just, the idea of like the the conversation, the first fifteen minutes of me walking into a room with those guys, um, I could I could picture a couple of hugs, but then inevitably there'd be some questions about royalty rates and uh, you know all these other. It, it would just get ugly quick. So, can I paint a fictitious scenario in my mind that I've had, like with sure, the guy? Let's hear it. Yeah. So let's say Eddie Vedder. But when we spoke last, you told me that when you found out that you guys had like a number one and you had gone gold, that he basically might as well have heard that his mother had died. Is that a fair way of metaphorically <laughs> speaking about the conversation? Uh, yeah, well, it was just basically, yeah, uh, it was, I was, it, the fact that I had to slink away from the table and, and you know, uh, call the crew and my friends and go, yay, quietly was, yeah, that's. So but, let's yeah, say now. It was kind of like. He's taken psilocylum or you know what? Ketamine. He's gone. He's gone to Tufts University. He's taken some ketamine treatment. He's realized that he needs to release like the song that he sings all the time. Like, so he finally releases all of the evil spirits and, and, and listens to the people every single day. Say David Aberziz was the greatest drummer in this band. And he finally lets go and calls you and says, you know what, dude? I'm going to pay you. One, if there's six people in the band, one sixth of the band. That exactly. And we're going to go out like old times because maybe he's terminally ill and this, this is what they want to do. And this is my chance to make this happen. I'll pay you the same. Fuck it. I realize I've, I've stared, stared into the abyss. I'm going to die, David. I want to be cool with you before I go. This is me, Eddie Vedder. Stone loves you, man. Jeff loves you. I fucking hate you, but I don't anymore. Will you come and play with me again? What would you say? Um, yeah, I would absolutely do that. I, 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 I the, yeah, for free. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would go play with those guys for nothing. Yeah, just, I mean, the opportunity to go play those songs again for the people who enjoy them with the people that I made them with would be awesome. Just be awesome. Plus, I'd love to see the look on their face when I start to shit out of my thumb. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you something that makes me sad is that one of my first shows I was ever going to go to was to see you guys on the Versus tour because one of the first bands I ever thought was cool was Pearl Jam. That's an absolutely true story. I learned it at Rocketry uh, uh, 
class at a stupid nerdy camp. I was taking a rocketry class and they're like Alice in Chains and this band Pearl Jam, man. Fucking awesome. And I just remember I, I bought tickets to go and then the, sh- the, the tour was canceled and they rescheduled to the Orpheum Theater. I no longer had a ticket. And now I see video of my favorite songs and dude, you you literally murder the kit. Like, I mean, I, I played with you. I listened to you play. And what people don't understand about David Abruzzese and the reason why I just rest my case, you're not, it's not about technicality. It's not about even technique. You have all those things. I'm not taking them away from you. You beat the shit <laughs> out of your fucking drums and there's no EQ, no compression, no even direct mm-hmm. micing needed for you. You could hear that through your tracks and you can't take yeah. that. That's in your hands, man. Yeah, I can't help it. I don't know what it is. It's always been like that. <laughs> even, you know, even now in the studio when I'm playing something that's, you know, down or whatever and we video it for you know, the way things are done now. Um, I look back and say, man, geez, I thought I was laying back. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. You're just keeping the drum head companies in business. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So, so now, so now go on. I want to continue with my fictitious confabulated fantasy here. I'm tripping. I'm about to hit it, hit my peak right now. Uh, trucking's coming on right after Terrapin station. We're good. <laughs> Jerry's got me feeling awesome. The nitrous balloons are just hitting in. I, I got that deep breath going now I'm on stage. I got the VIP experience with Pearl jam. Ah, it's worth nothing but, <laughs> for, no, no, it's all for the frogs. It's all to get frogs out of high school so that you can take the frogs. No, it's all for free. You said you do it for free. Eddie's going to do it for free. Jeff's going to do it for free. Stone's going to do it for free. Dave Matthews Band's going to open for fucking free. And what's going to end up happening, <laughs> what's going to be the set? What do you think the vibe's going to be like? We're at Fenway Park right now, David. This is what's oh, going to be shit. because that's what, what what's happening. First of all, it'll be me regretting saying I do it for free. (laughs) 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 Having to, yeah, we'll have to have a conversation pre gig for that. Um, (laughs) It's for the frogs. What would happen? I think it would be, um, I I don't know. You know, maybe uh, would I be arrogant enough to say it would maybe remind those guys what it used to be like? I think that I think some of those 40, 50 plus year old people would, would remember how to jump up and down and kick each other in the head if we played together. <laughs> well, you're an Arlington, Texas guy. Pantera is playing together. And I saw a video from Chile, right? And it's like they're doing the fucking wave of people jumping to to walk. Yeah, no. And, I, and, and yeah, what, I, was so I need to know for blabbermouth hunt, for blabbermouth, for metal injection, for revolver, for metal yeah. sucks. What what does David Abruzzi's formerly a Pearl Jam think of the Pantera reunion tribute? Is it that what tell me how I'm supposed to feel as a Texas guy that knew dime? Man, I personally think um <laughs> I think Dime would be in the crowd jumping up and down, having a great fucking time. Personally, I mean, when I, I saw that footage, you know, Abe being the tech for Charlie, Charlie being a friend and all this, I was really excited uh, for them to be doing it. And so I, I was like, you know, actually the night of the first gig, I was like on YouTube waiting for someone to post something. But yeah, I was really excited that they were doing it. Really excited, you know. I, I put it, I don't have any opinion about the, whether it be a reunion or this or that, whatever. It's just fantastic. I just think it's fantastic. So you said you were a tech for Charlie Benante of, of Anthrax? You were Charlie's tech? No, 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 no Charlie's tech, Abe, is a, is a friend, and so is Charlie. So I was really excited for them, and, and I knew Charlie would do it justice. And, yeah, I, I knew that it wouldn't be done unless those unless Zach... And and Charlie felt like, you know, I mean, because both of those guys are so soulful and real. Um, 
that when they announced they were going to do it, I I knew it was going to be something special, or they would have never done it. You know? I think it's cool. I mean, it, I I don't. It's not the Pantera that I mean. I used to see Pantera when I was sneaking into clubs and they were playing Dokken and Van Halen covers, and with you know, Fantex on, and it was a totally different thing. I, I remember being at the Foundation Forum in, in uh, 1991 when uh, you know Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Temple of the Dog, uh, Pantera all were playing this this show. And I remember these guys walking through the crowd, and it was the first time I'd seen them since I was 18 years old. And, you know, I mean, I, I was at the first gig they did with uh, with Bill when he joined the band, and he had a bi-level, you know, surfer haircut and was wearing spandex. And was, it was a totally different thing. And then here he comes walking past me with, you know, uh, tattoos on his head, and it was just like, whoa, <laughs> these guys changed. And they were incredible, just incredible. Um. Yeah, they, uh, Pantera it will always be something special to me, you know, just from the memories I have growing up, watching them play these 200 seat clubs and seeing Dime stand on old steakhouse tables and play Eruption and amazing, just amazing. <laughs> So for the transition from that to to where they they came, how how did that look being there and observing it? Was it surprising? Like, you know, so obviously exciting, the change was... So exciting. Was... Well, um, no, because they were always, they were always, like, no, because it's, for, in such a short span, they were it's evolving so much, you know, as, as they were growing up. And, and um, no, it wasn't surprising. It was so exciting that it was kind of scary and off-putting. And then I saw him play and it was like, you know, this is, you know, it's like I rooted for him from, from the first time I saw him play, uh, it was the Cowboys from Hell album. I was, yeah, you know, yes, please. <laughs> you know, it was so refreshing and, and such a new thing, really. I mean, there was no, I mean, I, I like metal and there was no band like them at all at the time, you know? So yeah, it's the Texas. It's the Good well, mind. it's the Texas power groove. And one of the things I got to tell you, I I went back and watched a lesson with Dimebag, and he calls when he, when he does all those kind of bends where he almost hits it and it's almost uncomfortable. He calls them the the Texas bends. So can you talk to us about like what what Texas and Pantera have in common? Because there's like a groove. Because they're the power groove. Can you explain to us white Jewish guys what a power groove is? <laughs> I think uh, you know. They just made shit up a lot. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, they were they were just doing their own thing. Maybe it has to do with with uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a threshold of saliva that you get from strippers that changes everything. <laughs> That's the only thing I could guess. You know. Um, they they were always woodshedding, and I don't think there was ever a time um, that I didn't have a brush with with Dime where where you know he didn't have like four shots in one hand and a bottle in the other, and yeah, you know, he was such a sweet guy, but so incredibly uh, kind of on the verge of dangerously outgoing, you know. I mean, it's, uh, some of his some of his pranks so, you know on youtube there's a lot of them but i remember him back in the day you know he would he would walk up behind someone and stick a firecracker down their pants you know what i mean he was just that kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> it's funny now but not when you lose a goddamn finger right right <laughs> or something worse <laughs> right there, there are a lot of there, there are a lot of videos of him and I just Google uh, Dime and Fireworks. Dime Vision, right? There's a whole there's a whole home movie. Pantera three, dude, just that alone. Oh my oh, god! Yeah. <laughs> videos from hell. Yeah, he was he was just so <sighs> fun. But yeah, in a, in a way that I'm, I mean, I'm glad I didn't hang out with him. It seems like there would be scars involved with hanging out with him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you gotta love the guy going to Ingbe Malmstein on a plane. Hey, man, don't you want a donut? And Ingbe doesn't want a donut because he's gonna unleash the fury. 
And just that clip alone of Dimebag yelling at Ingve to eat a donut is the reason why I want to be in the school of Dime and not Ingve Malmsteen. As much as I love Ingve and I think he's incredible, I, I can't take life that seriously. I never saw that. There's a video of Dime insisting that Ingve have a donut. Oh, dude, it's, it's dude. You gotta look this up. It's literally one of the greatest clips in, of all time. It's 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 it's. it's uh, Ingve goes. He's talked about himself in the third uh, person. He goes. Ingve don't like donuts. <laughs> it's dude. I I can't make it. It's like the most spinal tap. Like God bless Ingve Malmsteen. Who by the way is like a, He's like six foot five. The guy's huge, and he's a more American than most Americans. Yeah. He's an American with all of his guns, and he'll fucking run you over with his Ferrari. So like, don't fuck with him. But like, man, it's funny. It's fucking funny because it's Dimebag Daryl because he was the man. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. I want to watch that. <laughs> well, let me let me ask. I mean, we and we've probably you know covered some of this in our previous episodes, but at the times that you were going out to the clubs and seeing Pantera, I mean, wh- where were you at in your career or your journey? Like what? What was going on in your life at that time as an artist musically? Um. Well, at that point, I was like, you know, sixteen, seventeen. Um. You know, having to go into the club through the loading area because I wasn't old enough to get inside from through the front door, even when I was playing. Um. I was just excited, you know, just excited and soaking it all in. I was still learning. Um, by everything that I saw other drummers do. I mean, that's that's around the same time that I I saw Shannon Larkin for the first time. Um, you know, it was just it was just all about. Well, I don't really think actually it was all about you know trying not to look stupid and and meeting girls. Yeah. <laughs> so wait a minute. Can we paint a picture for people? Because you told us. Well, I just want to ask because you you were on an episode with Shannon Larkin. We actually got you two crazy yeah. birds together. So if you guys haven't seen it, go back two zero two zero dash d dot com. Subscribe and go check out Shannon and David. And let me tell, I made a mistake. So I thought. I had just met Shannon, who's one of the nicest guys on the planet. He gave me this jacket to wear. It's blue velvet. Thank you, Shannon. And the Moog in the background. It was a passive-aggressive Christmas present that I need, because I'm like, I don't know how to use an analog keyboard. Buys me a Moog. I love this guy. He's like literally the greatest dude in the world. But when you first met him, it was in 1984 in Wrathchild, America, and he had a boa constrictor around his neck. Yeah. What was that like? And <laughs> how did you know that Shannon Larkin was going to be Terrible. the guy knocking out Metallica out of the number one spot with Godsmack? Uh, well, you know, it was it was one of those things. You know, a, a guy that I was playing music with that was like, you know, in our little circle, he was the guy who, you know, he was always like, you got to check out this band. Or who the fuck is, you know, that? Who is this? Who's King Diamond? Who's Merciful Fate? And uh, he said, no, this drummer, you got to see this drummer, you know. And so he talked him up so much. Um, and then, you know, getting to see him play, I was completely blown away. You know, he, I mean, I guess Shannon said he was 17 at the time. Um, but, yeah, he was amazing, you know. And, and I wanted to say hello, but his snake scared the shit out of me. So I, didn't get a <laughs> <laughs> I can picture it. <laughs> oh my god oh yeah it was too much he i remember him you know he was a sound check he had the snake around his neck damn it <laughs> i don't want to go near that snake. yeah but how about his playing <laughs> why was he so tell me as as a guy that can only uh, i can't even play four on the floor what makes a guy like shannon he, larkin so good why what about him uh, it, it's first of all he was doing exceptional things effortlessly I mean, it, and he was having such a good time that it was infectious. You know, he was, he was, yeah, it was basically, you were, it was such, uh, he was a drummer. He was so natural. But, you know, he was doing things, you know, I mean, at, at the time, you know, yeah, there was Tommy Lee who twirled his sticks and grabbed cymbals and whatever. But Shannon was doing, like, his movements and the way he danced around his drum set and, and, he, it was all, you know, there was no one else doing it. And he was, and it, and he just looked so effortless, 
you know, just playing the shit out of his drums and lighting a cigarette, you know, and, you know, it was just like, yeah, it was amazing. It was just amazing. And, um, and the, and, and the band, I mean, they, they, the way that their music was, it really allowed him to shine in such a big way. Do so many fanciful things, but still not overdoing it and all. It was just a powerhouse, you know? And I'd never seen anyone um, with with such, not in the metal world, you know, uh, metal guys always seem to be, you know, just on the verge of falling over. You know, they were just <laughs> really trying so hard. Um, but he just, yeah, he it just looked effort, effortless and like he was playing exactly what he wanted to play and was, and was supposed to play. And it was just, yeah, he was just amazing. So let me ask you this. You, so you, you sounded like you couldn't be happy when we were. So one of the things I learned from you is that, you know, you had to go. You said you had to go run to the other room when you found out that your your record was doing awesome and you were making money and things were going well because Eddie Vedder's in another room sulking. What what wh- why was he that way? What was that like? And then why were you still in the band? And what was that like for well, you? The actual experience of that was um, our manager had come out and we, you know, it was like, let's all, we're all going to dinner, which was kind of like, okay, you know, it's kind of unusual, but, you know. So it was the band and our manager and we were at an Italian restaurant and, um, you know, partway into the meal, uh, it was like, you know, Dave, there's a reason we came to an Italian restaurant. Um, we want you to be a full member of the band. You know, it was like, what? Well, you know, you're a part of the band now, officially. It's like, oh, great. Oh, this is that, you know. Awesome. Did they know you were Native American? <laughs> Why would they take you into a Native American restaurant? Jesus <laughs> the reason we're eating maize, uh, but anyway, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm sitting with that and then, at some point between bites, our manager Kelly just kind of he just kind of murmured, "Oh yeah, the record went gold." And and I just it's like I, I remember like halfway through that sentence, the record went and I looked at it. He said gold, and I'm just like, you know, I'm it's still chiming in my head that the label had said if we didn't sell twenty thousand copies, that we probably weren't going to be able to make another record. And he said that, and I was just like like looking around the table waiting for everyone else to react and it's still just forks on plates and uh, nobody said a fucking thing and i was just (laughs) wait a minute what and he said yeah the record went gold yesterday and i'm still waiting for some sort of reaction (laughs) but i knew enough already at that point that you know um if it didn't already come it wasn't gonna so I excused myself and went over to the, you know, they had coin pay phones still at that time. <laughs> and I put my change in and I, I called my folks and told them and they, yay. And then, um, I got in touch with the hotel and, and told some of the crew guys, you know, so when we got back to the hotel, it was like me and the crew got together and went, yay. But yeah, that was, that was the extent of the celebration that was allowed. And why and was that? It was just but, like but there was wh- nothing. Why was there no reaction or no celebration about that? During that point, up, up to that point, I was just working really hard. I wasn't paying attention to how I was supposed to behave. And maybe the other guys had paid attention enough to know that if they were to have celebrated, that, that it would have been negatively you know, reflected upon by their illustrious singer. Like it was the, the, not the right way to be. Um, yeah, something like that. I don't know. It, it still it amazed me, that, you know, because that was, you know, we all dressed up like Kiss when we were kids. You know what I mean? It was like we all <laughs> were trying to do this thing, and here it was happening, and all of a sudden there was no, you know, no togetherness, no, like, yay, we achieved something, you know? So, yeah, I, I really can't speak to why it was that way. I just know from then on it, it stayed that way. That there were no, you know, 
I, I mean, I, I think the band celebrated Stone shaving his head more than celebrating selling five million albums. Wow. Thing. So, so. Yeah. Wait, but hold on. <laughs> but, but don't you think but that, don't you think that this is literally the definition, definition of mystique? I mean, come on. Cause like, if you're not really upset, you're not really hurting for it. Is it really fashion? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Vedder came off as the most emo before like the emo thing. Ever. Like, I'm sad. Like I'm introspective. Yeah. I'm philosophical. He's the kind of guy that would like, you know, he's a contrarian. Like that's the dude who wrote all the lyrics. I mean, he all, and that's why he like, you know, all of his songs are so good because he takes that POV and people can relate to it because there's lots of assholes out there that were on some side of those introspective egocentric lyrics that are very well written and go with the songs. But all that said, if he didn't, if he wasn't inherently kind of a douchebag do you think that there'd be mystique to the band and that they would be around for this long i have no idea i mean you know of course it, i mean it helped at the time i guess it was fashionable to talk about how much you hated being on the cover of magazines while you were doing an interview on the cover of a magazine <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what i Fuck Rolling Stone! When I stopped, yeah, while you're on the cover of Rolling Stone, saying "fuck Rolling Stone," mm -hmm. is that's when I kind of stopped paying attention to it, you know. So, I mean, he did have a stack of every article that we ever did was in his bunk on the bus, so he knew what he was doing. Very smart fella. Well, don't you think he stayed informed so that he could be a contrarian? Like that's what he is. He's a he was a real life troll. That's kind of what he does. He's like, oh, yeah, dude, I saw frogs being killed in schools. And, well, they were actually already dead. And I think they were killed humanely. But don't dissect them or I won't sell you tickets to shows. Like, that's the actual stance he took. I remember him doing that as a kid and being like, and the, there was a, a B-side called Frogs. And I'm like, okay. And I, I dissected a frog in school and I love animals. But I'm like, does it somebody need to know how to... Fix a frog? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just never paid attention that much to what he was talking about, I think. I, you know, maybe I, I would have still been in the band had I studied a little more better. I mean, better. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, um, yeah, I didn't look out for that. I just looked out, you know, I just took care of my blisters and made sure that my broken shit wasn't broken. You yeah, know, as one should. Going. Okay, but you have to tell me about something because I, I I watched I watched an old episode, and mm -hmm. there was a night where you snapped. That basically, because you know Eddie was very much a dancer around your drum kit. He was trying to Im imitate our friend Shannon Larkin, but not playing the drums. Right. And one night on the uh instead of the and, <laughs> you got this guy in the face. Uh, yeah, I got no. I with got a it. fucking I got with a ball. symbol with Wait. a hi hat. But why? What t tell take us through that moment, David? Uh, like, what happened? Why were you ready? Did you think about this ahead of the show? What? Where was this? What happened? When, when did you fucking murder Eddie's face with your no, with your it, Zildjian? It, it, was it a, a Pisces? It, it wasn't a face. It was a Sabian. <laughs> but it was during this period of time when, yeah, and it was uh, there was a period of time where. And I think we were, we played it. Maybe it was the cat house or something. And it was a bunch of industry people. So Eddie was in a really shitty mood. This is all in retrospect at the time. Uh, it just pissed me off, but he, you know, this particular night, there was a, a particular fill that he wanted me to do this thing to make it bigger or whatever. And I was doing it, but it was like, you know, we all had our, our, you know, ways of getting amped up or, those or whatever and um so he at this particular night after this fill he decided to throw a water bottle at me and um so what i did in return was during the quartz jam when he was monkeying around on stuff i ended the song while he was hanging from some rafters in the middle of the club <laughs> 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 and and that started this little thing between us but they were I don't want to say it was on purpose, but it kind of was on purpose. You know, there were there was a time where he would turn around and he would, you know, either with a mic stand or with his fist, he would hit a couple of my cymbals or whatever. And I, he turned around and was coming back, and he went like this, and so I I 
threw my left arm up and hit the symbol on the and instead of the downbeat so it would go up and yeah and so when he hit the thing he hit it with a symbol like that so you'll see photos there's photos of eddie with stitches and a wrap around his hand because that symbol bit right into it and i i don't you know i i didn't put enough thought into it to think that i'm gonna get him i'm gonna injure the guy i just thought it you know would sting a bit or something but it ended up yeah giving him a scar for life i'm pretty sure um but yeah, yeah but he loves that scar because it makes him seem cool one of my proudest moments <laughs> but at the time it felt good <laughs> When I was out there in the Ozfest, and not only do I get to watch fucking Mike Borden from two feet, like his, I was like his drum tech every night. It was insane. But and then Vinnie Paul during Sabbath takes some chick underneath uh, Borden's riser, <laughs> and he had checked, asked Mike Borden, you know, can I? And Mike's like, go if, on stage. Mike's like, go ahead, man. And he fucked, they crawl under his and Vinny bangs his chick underneath his visor while Black Sabbath's on stage. So that's fucking, that's a brick wall right there, baby. <laughs>